A car is driving along a solitary, dark road late at night. The headlights beam off the eyes of a cat. A road sign says that we will soon be approaching the secluded rural village of Strangehaven. In the rain, a blonde woman in a black dress stands in the middle of the drive. The man swerves to miss, but still hits her, then a tree, and then blacks out. This man is Alex Hunter, and he will soon find himself in the midst of a conspiracy, wrapped up in all the denizens of this sleepy village, located ambiguously in the middle of somewhere. It is the type of place where every face holds a familiar, knowing smile that gives the impression that they know more about you than you would really prefer, and behind its grin lies a secret or two of their own. Hunter soon finds that it's the kind of place that, once you arrive, you aren't really allowed to leave again, even if you try. A black hole of a small town that pulls you into its center before crushing you with its implications and gravity, with an ambivalence of country quaintness. Strangehaven, which began publication in 1995, is the creation of writer and artist Gary Spencer Millage. And that statement is more true than for just about any comic that has ever existed. And that statement will also make more sense here in a bit. Born in Hackney but raised in Essex, he grew up with an interest in the arts, and would eventually attend Southend School of Art, but didn't initially follow through with this career path. He played in bands, enjoyed sports, and ran his own comic shop, throughout the 1980s. After it closed, he spent time working for a shoe manufacturer and a retail outlet. But over the years, he grew tired of this lifestyle and longed for an outlet of self-expression to explore ideas that he liked in media that are not often seen. And as a result, Strangehaven was born. Unlike my usual self, I'm going to tell you very little of what is contained within this comic. I'm going to give you very little information about it at all at least as far as its plot is concerned. It's a good read and worth going in fairly blind for it. I didn't even know that it existed until this past January myself. I was in a used bookstore and it caught my eye in a box of books that had sat on the shelf for too long. They were going to be thrown away if nobody purchased them. Without knowing anything about it, I bought it for a dollar. I thought to myself as I rifled through its pages that it looked like if you made Twin Peaks into a comic. I even thought that this character was probably the Dr. Jacoby stand-in, and when I later read it, I found out that he was indeed the local quirky doctor. And this assumption proved to be true, as I would later learn that Millage said in September of 1995, Twin Peaks is one of many, many influences, and because of its transatlantic cult following, the English rural Twin Peaks, quote, was a convenient soundbite. But I could have used something as equally inaccurate like The Darling Buds of May Falls Into the Twilight Zone or Shillingbury Tales Meets Brigadoon for the 90s. But that might not have meant as much to potential readers. And this is one of the many reasons that I admire this book and think that Strangehaven succeeds where many other Twin Peak knockoffs fail in that this really isn't a knockoff. There are flavors of it here, sure, but there are so many others both from other media and original ideas blended together to make something new, mysterious, and weird. It feels like a spiritual successor to where Twin Peaks was heading before its cancellation, or a reflection on what type of media Twin Peaks fans expected versus what Twin Peaks actually was. It is a comic that signals with its very name that it will try within the medium to create the melodramatic atmosphere of a small town filled with secrets, where everyone knows each other, is sleeping with each other, and also has secret murderous intent. A sinister story wrapped around an inner core of humanity, a feat that would be very difficult to do. Most comics only have a handful of characters, and juggling a whole host of branching character stories in the same small setting that impact each other would be difficult for a veteran artist, let alone someone's first professional work. It is doing its own thing, where most Peaks-inspired works consist more of pale imitation and half-sincere references. And it does its own thing quite well. And even if you are not into comics, I believe that this is something that you could potentially be into if you like slow-paced, methodical, character-based horror narratives. As he would say, One of the original intentions when I created Strangehaven was to appeal to the vast, untapped audience for comics which surely exist out there, i.e. the 99.9% .9 of the population to which superhero comics don't appeal. And if I can introduce one or two new readers to what comics has to offer, then I'll be a happy man. 
On the inspiration for the town itself, he would say reflecting on a trip that he took in the early 90s. We kept going around and around, coming back to the same crossroads and going past the same places. Eventually, we came over this hill and came face to face with this beautiful little secluded village. I modeled Strangehaven after it. I've put some landmarks from the village in, as well as a few of my favorite shops and buildings. So I've got the best of both worlds. It is like all fictional places, a dream visage of our own reality that is a halfway point between the real and the unreal by its nature. And in that, it finds a certain truth. It is at times painfully slow moving, both as far as story is concerned and its release schedule. But that's also kind of the point. As someone who has spent a great deal of time in a fairly weird small town, sometimes nothing happens for weeks or months on end, only to then be followed by a horrible moment that you will remember for the rest of your life. It is a reflection of life in that more often than not, you will find yourself sitting in a park or a home or restaurant talking with someone about something that doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things, as opposed to doing something that would be traditionally considered heroic or important or worthy of a comic book story. It is melodramatic, bizarre, and at times briefly horrific, and unlike anything that I've ever read within the medium. I really like how he describes the series himself, saying that it's ostensibly a murder mystery set in a small, isolated village in southwest England. Strangehaven fuses elements of folk horror, supernatural soap opera with offbeat humor, and an impossibly idealized vision of British rural life. Strangehaven is a meticulously crafted patchwork of murder mystery, quantum theory, secret rituals, and tangled human relationships. It questions the very nature of reality and how to make the perfect cup of tea. And the reason I like this so much is that it gets what works with this kind of thing where others don't. I'm going to do a whole Alan Wake thing soon, but I think that game is pretty bad. And one of the things that I hate about it and how it handles story is that it gets really crazy very quickly and never presents the day-to-day -day mundanity of their life, which makes the horrors that appear in their town seem horrific. It only has hints and flashes of it as flavor text without actually saying anything interesting or understanding why those elements are necessary in a small town with weird stuff story. But Strangehaven gets that. It is a story about people and how they are connected with this shared communal setting, whether they want to be or not. As an artist, Millage doesn't care to spend whole issues at a time on material that seems like it doesn't matter to the greater narrative at large. But to these characters, it very much matters. This is their lives, and everyone's life is special and important to them, even the most mundane aspects of that life. A work like Alan Wake would never understand this type of story well enough, to include something like the roadhouse scene in Episode 7 of Twin Peaks The Return. That goes on for an agonizing amount of time as we watch one man slowly clean up after the bar has closed. But Strangehaven does. There are whole pages of a local carpenter, Jeremy, fixing a shelf. This is a subplot that goes on for multiple issues. There's a cliffhanger where he realizes that he's bought the wrong screws and has to go back to the hardware store. And it doesn't matter to anyone in the slightest except for Jeremy because that is his job and how he is able to continue to live. And this isn't the only time that this happens. We get whole sections where we watch a man fix a car or learn the correct way to brew tea. And while these are not quote-unquote important, they make up the spirit of humanity and personhood that creates the lived-in world central to Strangehaven's identity. Some would argue that these scenes are gratuitous and that nothing happens in them, but that's the point. A large aspect of rural life is nothing happening at all. You can't have the small town with weird stuff if you're not going to explore the small town. That's cheating. But as you will soon see, bringing this into existence wasn't an easy task. Making this thing, building this world, creating something to match the idealized vision in one's mind, and trying to get people to even know that it existed was an impossible task that was attempted, more or less, alone. Strangehaven was the complete work and vision of one singular person, Gary Spencer Millage, and is the story that sometimes the pursuit of what you want to bring into the world is done on a road of sacrifices and pain. He would say in July of 1998, three years into this process, it was one of those times in life where you find yourself at a fork in the road, or even at a crossroads, maybe like the central character of this book. Whatever route I decided to take sooner or later, I would have ended up here. 
I wanted to create a series that had the space to grow with me as I gradually learned the various skills of the comic creator. Plotting, writing, drawing, painting, designing, and storytelling. The unique combination of elements that makes comics such an underrated and wonderfully unique medium. After completing my first 24 pages, I naively flirted with the idea of finding a publisher, before I realized that this project was too personal to entrust to a third party, and in June 1995, went ahead and published the first issue myself. Some may view self-publishing to be another name for Vanity Press. Others may perceive it to be the ideal method to preserve a single creative vision in a popular format. Either way, it has allowed me to freely express myself without interference from editors and censors, beyond only my limitation as an artist and a writer. But no matter how much you read about the trials of self-publishing, or how much you listen to your peers, nothing can prepare you fully. The sheer number of different tasks a self-publisher must attend to can be overwhelming at times. Bookkeeping, production, promotion, distribution, retailers, and readers are just some of the things that strive to prevent you from getting back to the real business of writing and drawing. Any pretense of social life is soon dismissed, and any savings you may have soon evaporate. But to realize your dreams, you have to make sacrifices, and believe me, I wouldn't have it any other way. So as I said a moment ago, this time you aren't going to hear from me all that much. I'll still chime in from time to time, you'll still hear from me throughout. But for a large part of this, I think it would be appropriate to let Gary tell his own story, more or less, in his own words. A good majority of what is contained here are quotes taken from letters, blog posts, and interviews, that I have organized in the best, most logical order that I can arrange them, that document the production of Strangehaven, and represent most accurately the headspace that he was in as it all unfolded. June of 1995 brought about the first issue of Strange Haven. We are introduced to some of our primary cast members, with 17 different characters being introduced in this issue alone. And that's only if you count the cult with its many members as one character. As well as being introduced to the town of Strange Haven itself. The art, while good, is rudimentary. The character work is rough and stiff. There is no sense of movement in his art yet, and when he attempts to pull off movement, it has no flow, and looks kind of bizarre. Many of the faces in these first few issues are also a bit wonky, but this in and of itself has a certain appeal to it as well, as issue by issue, you can watch as he improves his craft dramatically, and takes this from a slightly weird looking comic to a masterpiece. The visual look of Strangehaven changes exceptionally over time. And seeing what he does in these first few issues and knowing what it will eventually look like gives a fun vantage into his progress as an artist. Like many first-time comic creators, myself included, he really enjoyed Watchmen and the work of Alan Moore in general. And so he chose the nine-panel grid layout to present this story, which seems fun, but as a storytelling device, you don't really realize until you start to play with it that it is actually quite limiting as a form in what you can achieve which Millage agrees, as he eventually drops it for that reason in exchange for a more modern approach. As an artist, it is a difficult and cramped style to pull off and make exciting, and if you're inexperienced, it can lead to some really strange framing of characters, such as here where Meg and Jeremy are talking, and to fit them both in the panel, it appears as if they're about to kiss, even though they are spatially sitting across the room from one another in this scene. And admittedly, these two do get really close eventually, so that might have been the intended effect here as a sort of foreshadowing. But usually with this kind of thing, if you have to ask what the intended effect was supposed to be, then there is something a little off in how it was executed stylistically. Here also begins a practice that would accompany each issue of Strangehaven, where Millage would address the reader with an open letter, often talking about the creation of that issue, or about things going on in his life. And in this first introductory one, Unfortunately, a lot of the warning signs of what was to come are already present. He says, You may think I've spent the years dedicating myself to my art, honing my writing and drawing skills, but unfortunately, I've wandered off into tangents many and various. Playing soccer, falling in and out of love, manufacturing furry slippers, playing in rock bands, fiddling about with computers, initiating an assortment of unsuccessful businesses, 
and generally avoiding responsibilities and having a good time. And yet, I've always been drawn back to the world of comics in various roles. This wonderful and unique form of art, entertainment, and communications in order to express myself. So here I am, back where I started. I feel like I've finally come home. Strange Haven is an ambitious project. It seems like it's part of my nature to bite off at least as much as I can chew. Only this time, I still feel hungry. If you were to look at the title page for this first issue, you would assume that there was nothing out of the ordinary here. It is a regular looking title page for a book. It is what you would assume to find. But if you were to inspect a little closer, you can already see some things here that are very much not normal. It reads, published quarterly by Abiogenesis Press. But that's not a real company, not really. If you look it up, as far as comics are concerned, Abiogenesis Press has only ever published issues of Strangehaven. And in an article around this time announcing the company's partnership with Diamond Distributors, the Abiogenesis Press publisher is listed as Gary Spencer Millage. A comic book is something that is put together by a lot of people. If we were to look at a recent issue of Batman, there is a credited writer, two line artists, a colorist, a letterer, variant cover artist, an associate editor, an editor, and that's not including everyone else from publishers to all sorts of people on the periphery who have their hands in the creation of any given book. Now, independent publishing traditionally works a little differently, but not all that much so. If we were to look at The Autumnal, which was a fantastic independent horror comic that started late 2020 that you should definitely check out. You have accredited writer, artist, colorer, letterer, publisher, editor-in-chief, art director, branding designer, managing editor, principal, and director of marketing. I say all of this to get to the point that even though comics have the optics of looking like one guy drawing cartoons on paper, when it comes down to it, comics publishing is something that involves the hands of a lot of different creatives operating on the same wavelength as a team, not unlike other forms of creation like filmmaking or game design. It's a lot more like that than one would assume. But here on the title page for Strange Haven number one, it just says, published quarterly by Abiogenesis Press. Gary Spencer Millage in this comic took the idea of a comic book being independent to an unheard of extreme. He writes Strange Haven. He draws Strange Haven. He designs the look of the book. He calls the printers and orders the copies of the book personally. He calls comic book shops all over the world to stock the book. He did all of the research necessary to put this project together. In the work cited page at the end of this, he lists 18 nonfiction books and articles that he used in scripting just this issue alone. Not only that, but the work is clearly referenced to real life photographs of real people and locations. The Minotaur, for instance, the local pub that the cast convenes in for drinks is based on the now closed Bull Inn that was located in Hockley, Essex, where he used to meet friends when he was younger. And this all meant that for every new location that was introduced, he had to take the time to actually go out into the world and take photographs of that location, and gather his models to take pictures of them for every single panel in each new issue. If you ordered this comic, Gary was the person who received that order, put your comic in an envelope, wrote your address on its exterior, and mailed it to you. This was a giant operation that he was attempting to do with no outside help. He started out this ambitious project trying to do every single job that would be required of a comic company, and decidedly did not have the intention of ever bringing anyone on for support. The idea of doing everything as creatively free as possible to him was worth the sacrifice of the sheer amount of time that it would take to pull off a single issue of this. And if you were wondering, that amount of time really would be more than there is in any given day. It would be feasibly impossible for any one person to realistically get all of this done in a time span that anyone would consider to be reasonable. But as he put it, as regards to hassle, running any kind of business involves a number of tasks, which can be difficult, unpleasant, and frustrating. But not necessarily more so than dealing with a hierarchical editorial system, like they have in place at some of the larger companies. At least you get to make the final decision and any mistakes are your own and it's ultimately so much more rewarding. At the end of the first issue, he writes, Strange Haven should be available in all good comic shops. Please support your local retailer. 
If they do not stock Strangehaven, they should be able to order it for you from their current list of official Strangehaven distributors. If you still have difficulty in obtaining any issues, you can order directly from me. Please note that all items are mailed flat, bagged, and in stiff, boarded protective envelopes, and sent via first class post in the UK and via airmail to Europe, the United States, and the rest of the world. All items will be mailed out to you as soon as possible, but please allow four to six weeks for delivery before assuming something has gone wrong. Payment in sterling only. I will accept checks for subscriptions. I don't mean to put it lightly when I say that Millage was attempting here to operate a world-spanning work of art and business from his living room, completely by himself in the days before most people had access to the internet, while also, at the same time, working a day job. Millage himself didn't even have the internet at his house as he would say in June of 1996. I personally have steered clear of getting involved with the wonders of digital communication as I don't want to get sidetracked into spending hours surfing the web or whatever it's called, but I'm sure it'll happen eventually. Managing this money that was being mailed out to him and figuring out what subscriptions went where and who to mail what to and packaging and mailing those things would have been a full-time job unto itself, let alone actually making the comic that he was mailing. As would overseeing printing of the book and calling comic shops to promote it and touring conventions. Right here at the beginning, I just want to stress that he is attempting to perform more jobs than is humanly possible for how many hours there are in the day and how many days there are in a year. This first issue's letter, he ends with the quote, Thank you for buying this issue. After a great deal of deliberation, I decided to include an additional eight pages of strip free of charge this time. In order to give a fuller taste of what's to come, next issue will contain 24 pages of strip that will be on sale in September. I do hope to increase my frequency as soon as I feel confident that I can keep to a tighter schedule. And of course, assuming I can count on your continued support. In September of that year, Strangehaven 2 was delivered as promised on time without delays. With his art, he is experimenting more with adding extra shading and gray tones and hash lines as compared to the work in the first issue, which is quite stark as far as shading is concerned. It is already taking on a more lifelike, yet still stiff appearance. And in a few occasions, there are still some really weird facial expressions going on here. On the production of this issue, he would say, Over the past couple of months, the emphasis of my life has moved almost entirely over to the joys and wonders of self-publishing. Although I spent many months organizing myself for the launch of Strangehaven 1, I don't believe anything could have really prepared me for what lay ahead. And no matter how well you are prepared, you can do nothing at all about the vague disinterest or downright inefficiency of others. But self-publishing gives me complete creative control of my work, and also the opportunity to present it and promote it in exactly the way I choose, financial restrictions aside. In case anyone doesn't realize, I not only write, draw, letter, paint, and do everything else concerning the creative side, including designing the look of the text pages, choosing the typefaces, and so on, but I have also foolishly undertaken to publish this magazine myself. That includes communicating with printers, distributors, and retailers, the tax man, the vat man, and generally doing things that need to be done when you're running your own business, as well as attempting to promote my work at the same time. In addition to all of that, I think I may be one of only a handful of creators attempting to publish in the UK, but to print in the US. This in itself has caused me far more teething troubles than it initially suggested, especially as my PC fax card refused to perform properly, if at all, for six weeks, leaving me without a satisfactory form of transatlantic communication. Ever tried to have a technical telephone conversation when your voice is coming back at you half a second later, and each time you speak, you cut off what the other is saying? I near nearly mad went int mad. I you tell can can tell you. Despite everything, Strangehaven 1 shipped out just on time at the end of June. Unfortunately, I am writing this editorial in mid-August, and most UK shops are still awaiting their initial deliveries of Strangehaven 1. Apparently, a fax message between different departments of a major distributor went astray, mid-Atlantic, and all copies destined for the UK instead sat on a shelf somewhere in the USA, collecting dust. We are also enjoying here in the UK a summer which actually lives up to its name. It is rapidly becoming the longest, hottest, driest summer since records began. 
and it's too bloody hot for me to work in, I can tell you. My hands are covered in some kind of heat rash. Ink dries on my nib as I draw, and my extra thick Bristol board is wrinkling up like corrugated roofing due to the heat from my hands. In addition to all of that, in the week set aside for putting the finishing touches on issue two, painting the cover for three, putting together the solicitation packages for October's distributors catalogs, sending off everything to the printers and doing reference work for three, I got felled by a stomach bug, which left me bedridden for most of that week. But despite everything, he concludes with his usual nature of seeing the best in things. I am looking forward to the future with some optimism. Strangehaven will run as long as enough of you keep buying it. I have only just begun to tell my tale. I hope you will join me for the duration. In December, Millage would get his first taste of his growing career as an artist, attending a convention in Bloomsbury, London, where he was a listed guest of the convention, among other well-known names, including Stan Lee. In issue three, he would include this photograph of the event, talking about how much it meant to him that the book was starting to be recognized by people. The letters column for that issue would be filled with submissions from people who were at that event, writing to say that it was great to be able to see him in person and how fun the convention was. This moment would have really been the first instance of validation, a somewhat confirmation that he belonged here, which is critical for anyone to continue down a path like this. One attendee said, I had a terrific time at the convention myself, mostly because of all the friends I met. Nobody was expecting a book so polished and professional, and especially not those beautiful covers. You put out a quality product and everyone wanted to meet the author. Reflecting in the months following this weekend, he would describe the feeling he experienced that day as, This kind of experience is so different from the 95% of the time spent slaving away at the drawing board in isolation. As I say, overwhelming. Hey, Issue 3 is late by two months. In his art this time around, he uses more deep blacks as well as including a few instances of incorporating full undoctored photographs as panels reminiscent of Dave McKean's work. I'm actually not convinced if this was a style experimentation or not, or if it was done because things were falling behind so much. But even though they don't stick around throughout the series, I think they're a fun touch. After three issues though, there is still no semblance of what would traditionally be considered to be a main plot. Here there are pages on time, space, the failure of empires, nuclear power and weapons, quantum theory and parallel universes, and what it means to exist in this space at this moment in time, and what it means to be who you are. All done in conversation over some sandwiches in the pub. And in this, I could see how Strangehaven might be frustrating to some narratively. By design, it feels a bit aimless. If you were to put these first three issues in front of someone and ask them to tell you what it was about or where it might go from here, they might struggle to come up with an answer. But this kind of non-conformist ambiguity is something that I like in this project, and is in part what makes this comic feel special. On the creation of this issue, Millage would say, There's been the usual last minute delays and problems, which I've come to expect. Last time I wrote, I was moaning about the heat and now it's snowing. Succumbing to a bout of flu at the most inopportune time is only to be expected. And I've learned to work through periods of poor health and writer's cramp. We even had a power cut which meant I had to ink a portion of this issue by candlelight in an unheated room. I've got an electric cooker, so I couldn't even make myself a cup of tea either. If anyone can guess the panel which I inked by candlelight, or indeed the panel which I smeared blood onto while erasing, I'll send them a special sign to something. Finally, I'd like to say sorry to all my friends and family who now no longer recognize me. As regular readers will know, self-publishing has rather taken over my life at this point. Callers to the Millage residence now have to make their own tea. Long-standing arrangements have been shelved and friends I once saw weekly I now only bump into during my monthly big shopping at Sainsbury's. Last time I visited my mom, I had to show her my passport before she let me in. Thankfully, all of them understand that my life has changed over the last few months. And hopefully, things will settle down a little in the coming year. One week before he was supposed to be a featured guest at two different conventions, he abruptly cancels due to circumstances beyond my control. Issue four is one month late. Despite some setbacks, Millage seems in high spirits. The first three issues have sold out of their American stock, 
and have been ordered for a reprint. And on that end, things are looking pretty good. But it is clear already that trying to perform about a dozen jobs at the same time is taking a massive toll on him. It seems that the Twin Peaks fan community in America has started to catch on to the comic because of an article in the fan magazine wrapped in plastic. He hires Chris Staros to handle his business arrangements in America, including being his liaison from here on in communicating with comic shops and overseeing ordering and making sure that the books are continuously stocked on shelves. This would take some pressure off of him, but certainly wouldn't be enough. Gary mentions that since starting work on Strange Haven, his hair, which once was a dark brownish black, has turned completely gray. This issue is notable because it is the first time that we really begin to branch out and begin to spool into more of the town of Strangehaven itself. Our main character, Alex Hunter, does not appear in this entry aside from a few pages. He certainly isn't the focus. And for the first time, the series alludes to the bigger picture at play. This also shows that he is willing as an artist to experiment with the series in weird, fun ways that others might not be inclined to do. In this chapter, we begin with two birds flying over Strangehaven, talking with each other about how fun it is to be raptors as they glide over the town, as we get small vignettes with different characters that they witness. Short little one or two page stories all over town that are setting up the pieces for a larger play. He would say, so much has occurred since number three. This issue has suffered all sorts of delays and problems, and it's tempting to list everything out as an excuse for being late. But that's one of the things I promised I wouldn't do. Not anymore, anyway. So I won't. Suffice to say that I could never have envisioned so many different things conspiring to keep me away from the drawing board in the space of a few months. In the letters column, one writer says a fairly good point that is starting to bother some, in that Strangehaven has no driving narrative. Twin Peaks is about so many things. It is slow, whimsical, meditative, weird, and thoughtful. At times, it seems to purposefully waste the audience's time. But at the back of that is the mystery that connects it all together. Who killed Laura Palmer? Strangehaven has nothing like that. But in a way, that too feels purposeful. As Mark Chadbourne pointed out in his letter, saying, My one criticism would be, I'd like to see more conflict. At the moment, it feels like floating down a river on a punt on a hot summer's day, watching the strange people on the bank. Shooting the rapids every now and then would engage one a little more, I should think. Still, I suppose you'll be sticking your finger in the mythological dark underbelly sooner or later, right? In response to this, all he had to say was, You've got the right idea. Just relax and enjoy the experience. Issue 5. It's been almost half a year since we've last heard from Gary. The comic book market has collapsed. The collector's spectator bubble has burst. Small publishers have folded. Marvel has filed for bankruptcy and has started to sell the rights to Spider-Man, the Fantastic Four, and the X-Men to keep their lights on. Diamond distributors have begun to eat up all of the other independent distributors as they fold. And as a result, Millage says that this has created cash flow problems that have led to the comic being difficult to remain stocked in stores both in Europe and America. Despite all that's happened, I remain optimistic at the prospects for Strangehaven and the future of the comic art form in general. He says that in the power vacuum, new distributors for adult comics are beginning to open, like Cold Cut, which he feels will lead his comic to have further success. He mentions that the book has begun to be a hit in Puerto Rico, and that gives him hope. Cold Cut would be around for a little over 10 years before closing in 2008. He would go on to say, on a personal note, I'd like to thank everyone, inside and outside the industry, for their support and understanding during the past few months, which have been a particularly traumatic time for me and my family. Your good wishes are very much appreciated. Illness, bereavement, and a broken relationship have all conspired to make this a rather miserable summer for me personally. But the continuing success of Strangehaven has certainly helped me through. And for what it's worth, this is the best issue of the run so far, and is the first time where it really feels as if Millage has a comfortable grasp on the medium. His writing and character work are improving, and as we learn more about the characters, we can distinguish them easily. And this one is one of those that makes Strangehaven so fun to read, both because of the mystery that he is building as to what is actually going on here, 
but also watching him slowly improve his craft over time. He ends the issue by saying, Hopefully these bad times are behind me, and we can all look forward to seeing Strangehaven on a more regular and timely basis in the future. Starting with issue 6, which should be in stores February 1997. Issue 6. Strangehaven has begun to receive some attention on a national level in the UK. Several radio stories have been published. A news crew has come to his house to record the production of a single page to play as B-roll for an interview, which will be broadcasted around this time. His wisdom teeth have begun to bleed and cause constant pain. One of the problems that I've faced as a self-publisher is that the more successful I've become, the less time I have to spend writing and drawing. This is a rather obvious thing to say in retrospect, but I had a woolly notion that when I first started out this adventure that my creation would reach a point where it would be financially supporting me long before I had to start doing TV, radio, and newspaper interviews, public speaking engagements, and such like. Of course, it's all very gratifying, and it's some reward for the hours of loneliness, scratching away at a piece of Bristol board with a worn-out Gillette 303. But balancing the various duties of a lone self-publisher, dealing with printers, distributors, retailers, stationary suppliers, couriers, with promotional activities like conventions, doing the household chores, and trying to remain in contact with friends, which at least gives you some illusory sense of what could be laughingly described as a social life while working outside comics part-time in order to earn the bare minimum to pay the bills to enable continued publication of my stories is a difficult thing to achieve. Especially when you take into account that it takes somewhere between a day and a half and two days to produce a page of Strangehaven, in addition to the other tasks mentioned above. It is also difficult to say no to someone who is offering you free publicity. At this stage of my career, I need every little bit of help I can get. I never harbored any desire to be a media star, but I realized that self-promotion is a necessary evil if you want to be successful. The result is that I've spent more time doing interviews, posing for cameras, and appearing at events than I really should have, or even wanted to. I hope that goes some way to explaining my tardiness with this issue, the fact that some correspondence has gone unanswered, and my acting like some kind of prima donna at recent conventions. All I can say is that I'm trying to get the balance right, and I'm hoping that if I ever get to the stage where I'm earning some kind of living at this, I'll be able to spend more time creating and less time playing at being a celebrity. In July of 1997, Gary sat down with Wizard Magazine for a feature in their 71st issue. He has a noticeably different tone here than he does when addressing his audience directly, much more optimistic and energetic about the nature of what his daily life is like. He openly contradicts a lot of the frustrations that he has felt in the past couple of years. I enjoy all aspects of it. I enjoy keeping in contact with people in the industry, dealing with the printers, and packing parcels up. It's fun making decisions and watching them come off. Possibly I would get bored if I was just sitting down drawing. It's the variety that actually attracts me. In this interview, he estimates that at his current pace, it probably takes him about 18 work hours to draw a single page of Strangehaven. When asked if this is reasonable with the intense art style combined with the other responsibilities that he has to juggle with, he responds, It just seemed like the right thing to do at the time. He confirms here that the characters in the story are indeed based on real models that he knows, friends, and family members who have to gather together each time he makes an issue so that he can photograph them for each panel. He also said that he is worried that he will get bored with the series if he knows where it is going. Confirming that he knows how it will end, but that he has no idea how the journey will take him there or how long the series will go on for. Issue 7. Another five month gap between issues. In this time, Millage has been nominated but would not win two Eisner Awards the most prestigious yearly award within the comics industry, in the categories of Best Continuing Series and Talent Deserving of Wider Recognition. He was also pulled over for a traffic stop, but was let off of the ticket because the officer recognized him and had read Strangehaven, although he did say that he didn't like it. He continued to make appearances at conventions around the world and appeared at the San Diego Comic-Con for the second year in a row. But actually managing the book remains an impossible task, and having the comic printed in America and then shipped back to him in England 
is becoming more difficult to deal with with each issue. Well, it's been another fun-packed few months. It started with everything going wrong as I attempted to get Strangehaven 6 off to the folks at the printer. Being let down by my art supply shop, computer crashing, US Customs holding up my artwork, a page missing from my Blue Line proof and the UK Customs holding up my comics on the return journey were a few of the highlights. Still, I should be getting used to it by now. This issue marks the beginning of the second arc of the comic. And it is here that it really feels like the main narrative and story begins. This is really the moment that it shifts into a supernatural horror comic in a really cool way. If we were still making Twin Peaks comparisons, then this is the equivalent of the introduction of the man from another place at the end of episode 2. It is the moment where it really becomes apparent that things are not actually as they seem. The art continues its ever-shifting evolution. Some panels are now painted in ink washes and he is becoming more comfortable in using lots of deep blacks to create a mood, instead of detailing everything. In early Strange Haven, he would have drawn everyone's eyes and mouths every single time, but here you can see him flirting more with lighting and that noir styling, blacking a lot of that out which creates a better mood as a result. Just in general, this issue marks another giant step in his growth as a visual storyteller. In early issues, there hardly were any shadows at all, and when there were, it was typically just a few lines to indicate that shadows should be there, which made the realistic style that he was going for at times look really off, because the hyper-accurate anatomy was contrasting with other things that we would expect from realism. But he is really delivering here on that front by this time in the comic's run. With this, though, comes a very major problem that would begin here, but affect the rest of Strangehaven, and is something that just has to be overlooked to enjoy it as a comic. In that, because Millage is using real-life people that he knew as stand-ins to photograph, and because the art was so dependent on those photographs, the characters begin to physically age and change, even though in-universe only a few weeks has passed. Alex was not in issue 6, so that means that the last time his actor was photographed was for the fifth issue that released in November of 96. And here, 11 months later, Alex now has a ponytail where before his hair was shorter, because the actor had grown his hair out. In fact, there are some panels where he looks so different that I could almost be convinced that in between issues 5 and 7, a different, similar-looking actor took over the role as Alex's model. One character does comment on the ponytail also, and it's just explained away by Alex saying, Yeah, I used to have it long during my misspent youth, but it does grow back fast. And there's also an attempt to kind of explain this away in-universe. In this issue, Alex gets lost in the woods for a period, and when he finds his car, it is overgrown with weeds. But he says that it's only been a few weeks that he's been lost, and he finds it quite odd that this happened so quickly. But also, in a flashback panel from before he was lost, he also has the ponytail, so it doesn't quite work in that way, and is a bit off-center as far as traditional logic is concerned. It almost feels as if Gary had become so reliant on photographic reference to the point that he wouldn't be able to accommodate for things like that, and just began to run with it. Such as the character Adam, who later goes bald as the series progresses, I assume, because the actor actually went bald in the making of the comic. Another notable instance is that Jeremy is supposed to be very young in the series, but as the issues continue, he looks much older and begins to have facial hair. In the first issue, he looks and is treated as if he's roughly 16 or so. But here he could easily pass his late 20s. But this could also be seen as a benefit. It certainly adds to the otherworldly parallel universe where time has gone funny feeling that Strangehaven is attempting to cultivate. Where things don't always come together neatly. It also doesn't help though that Gary seems to have a fairly loose grasp when it comes to continuity. But only sometimes which makes it difficult to differentiate when something is purposefully weird or when something is a genuine mistake or product of real-life constraints. He says that he has a map that he uses of the town, and that all the drawings are geographically accurate to where the scenes are taking place. But also, there are occasional jarring mistakes. A big one being in this issue where Alex walks on foot back to that signpost from the night that he hit the woman in the road, and it is clearly a different signpost with the first one being marked as a half mile and the new version being marked as eight. 
Not that it's a big deal to me at all. I'm not a stickler for these kinds of things typically and often don't even notice them. It's just that when you're going for something as detailed as this, instead of an exaggerated artistic design based style like a lot of artists employ, when a certain detail is off, it tends to hit a lot harder than it might in a different kind of comic. But like I said, not a big deal for me. But those little things that pop up over time may or may not affect your mileage of enjoyment with the series. Issue 8 arrives just two months later ahead of schedule, a sign that things might be turning around for Millage, and that Strangehaven might have a more regular schedule from here on. But he also said that Issue 7 had so many problems with the printing that it made Issue 8 follow soon after it because he had already started drawing it before 7 was on shelves. He also had a more firm deadline to meet than usual before the end of December, as it is the Christmas special, which is the favorite time of year for Millage. He has for years sent out a Strangehaven themed Christmas card to people who have subscriptions for the book. Every time you read his thoughts around Christmas, they are always much more positive than other times throughout the year. But that being said, not everything is well here. Every year Christmas disrupts the production of Strangehaven, and on that tenuous link, I'd like to apologize for the rather erratic scheduling of this book. Sadly, he was unaware that a four-day weekend would happen around Thanksgiving in America, which would lead him to just barely missing his printing deadline, resulting in almost all comic stores in America and Europe receiving the Christmas special in January. This issue, while good, is probably the weakest out of the series, at least in my opinion. It does not advance the main plot nor any of the side plots and also doesn't give us much of anything as far as new bits of characterization to flesh out the people of the town. And it's just about the Christmas celebration and why the town of Strangehaven celebrates Christmas in August. Again, it is good. It is well put together and tells its own self-contained story like most Christmas specials would. But I know that if you were reading this as it came out, then any issue that didn't advance anything at all would have been incredibly frustrating as an audience member. Even the most supportive fans, I imagine, would have questioned this decision. It's the only time that the series feels gratuitous and self-serving in a bad way. Typically, its side tangents are used to reinforce the story and world as a whole. Something that you learn about a character in their side story makes their later decisions in the larger narrative make sense. But in this case, you could literally go from issue 7 to issue 9 and wouldn't even realize that you had skipped a chapter. Even the characters themselves seem to skip this chapter. As Adam asks Alex when they bump into each other in issue 10 if he had a good time camping, even though they see each other and have a chance to talk here in issue 8, which neither of them seem to remember. Issue 9. Six months pass. He mentions that for a time he suffered from a mysterious illness that ruined his ability to work saying that on his best days in this time, he was only able to get about 60 to 80% of his normal output done. He also took his first vacation since starting the book in 1995, visiting a resort north of Cambridge. He also had to take extra time to oversee the design of the first trade paperback of Strangehaven, which was to collect the first six issues. He also announces that to avert more cash flow problems, he will begin selling all of the original art from Strangehaven, including the painted covers an act which will later cause problems in trying to reprint the comic, as he would have to rely on the older, less clear 90s scans of the line art than a modern machine could produce. The Simpsons begins to broadcast by his television provider, and he mentions that he has enjoyed getting to finally watch what he has heard Americans talking about for years. It seems that for a time, he lived life. By this point, he has almost perfected his craft. As I said, early Strangehaven has quite an off-kilter look at times. But by issue 9, that is a thing of the past. Every single panel demonstrates a masterful use of line work and craft. Every drawing is done with amazing precision. You can feel the time passing on the page. No more weird faces, every expression reads the way it would in person. It is life reflected on the page in ink. He ends this month's letter with the ominous message, Hope you think it's been worth the wait, and I promise the next one will be along a little sooner than this issue was. Issue 10. Another five months pass. 
At last, Strangehaven reaches double figures, and I guess I can allow myself a little satisfaction. Even though it's taken me much longer to reach this particular milestone than I would have anticipated. He reflects on the depression that it has taken 42 months to get 10 issues completed. Comparing himself to the rapid pace at which David Sim was able to write and draw Cerberus on a regular schedule, saying, In order to emulate Sim's incredible 236 issues and counting, I'll probably need to live till I'm several hundred years old. Still, any excuse for a celebration. He confirms that even though the series continues to sell well, that each issue only actually has a few thousand readers globally. Despite this, as it continues to go on, each issue only gets stronger than the last both in terms of art and writing. As he strengthens his talents to build this world after laying a very stable foundation with the first arc. Issue 11. Five month gaps have now become expected for Strangehaven. This in a way I feel represents a turning point, both in the optics of how Millage is trying to present himself as well as the story. As we begin to drop side plots and build up more and more tension within the narrative. The opening letter that accompanied this issue has a joking tone to it, but under that I can't help but get a sense of the emotional truth here that feels a bit desperate, sad, and obviously filled with embellishments. He starts off the letter with the sentence, I receive a lot of letters asking about a self-publisher's typical daily routine, which to me immediately feels like when a YouTuber starts a video by saying, Now a lot of you guys have been asking about this, so I thought I'd make a video on it. Everything in this reads as extremely false, which was the obvious intended effect. He is deliberately trying to be funny. What he lists here is close to pure fantasy and directly contradicts a lot of the independent aspects of how he has described Strangehaven in the past. So far in 10 issues, he has mentioned that he has one employee, Chris Staros, who handles his American business dealings. But just listen to the way that he describes a so-called typical day in the creation of Strangehaven, which does not once mention any actual time dedicated to drawing. Wake up before 6 a.m., have orange juice, go for a run, then go to the gym for one hour. Breakfast while sorting through fan mail. At 8.30, he goes to the studio. He checks in with his secretary, Tanya, to see if he has any new emails. His press agent, Neil, arrives with the latest papers and magazines concerning Strangehaven reviews and interviews. And we spend about half an hour or so going through them and making further suggestions on how to enhance my public image. At 11, he has a daily meeting with two men who he names Paul and Trevor, which he describes as, my head writers to see if they've come up with any usable ideas for my next issue or any other merchandise or such like. Which is a bizarre thing to say on a few levels. One, because Gary writes every issue of Strangehaven, and two, is that it should be noted that aside from a few prints and the annual Christmas cards, I can find no evidence that there has ever actually existed traditional Strangehaven merch in the form of shirts or anything like that. Even today on his website, the only thing that he is selling is books or prints that you can order directly from him. After this, he has a business video call with Chris Staros in America and a man named Steven in Canada. At noon, Tanya brings him lunch. If it is a Thursday, he will get a package in the mail of all of the new comics that came out that week, and he will sit and at least flip through each of them and read several of them. He then says, I call Alan Moore or Frank Miller or whoever to tell them what I thought of their latest books. After that, Neil has probably set up an interview or photo session with either the comics press or sometimes national and local newspapers and TV. Sometimes during the week, his hairdresser Linda will come to the studio herself to cut his hair while he works. During this, he will look over the printer proofs for the next issue or study detailed sales reports. He has meetings with his accountant Tony, his bank manager Simon, his fund manager John, he calls Glenn from Diamond Distributors and his printer Patrick almost every day. After this, he goes to the Abiogenesis Press warehouse, which is on the other side of town, where he personally monitors the level of stock that they have. He sits down with the warehouse manager Tim over coffee and donuts to go over the figures. He ends the day with a full 18-hole golf game with either his brother David or his brother-in-law, Russell. After this, he says, I'll pop back in the studio to see how things are progressing before I finish for the day. Usually I find there's a problem or two I need to attend to before I can get home. He then has dinner out with the wife and children. 
and may go to a movie. Now, this is obviously not based in reality. It is, I believe, intended to be satire and is definitely intended to be funny. The letter itself has a bit of a joking tone to it, especially the part where he mentions that he has a personal driver who is also named Gary, and the end bit where he mentions that he has to take a private helicopter to visit the Prime Minister. But underneath the surface of the tone, all these things that he mentions are actual things that he personally does to make Strangehaven happen, just in a less glamorous form. He mentions all of these things, including photo sessions and separate letters, that have a more serious or depressing tone to them. Was this written out of a response to counteract how depressing his last letter was, talking about how Strangehaven isn't a financially viable project and might never be? The more I think about it, the more I wonder what the intent was behind this. What aspects of it are real, and what parts are not? What message did he want me to walk away from having read this? Is he depressed that his daily life is not like this? Is this as he wishes things to be? For me, it is one of the strangest things that he has ever put out there publicly. And there would be more like this to follow, where he would occasionally bounce back and forth between manic and depressive tones, when he addressed his audience in written form. The writing in this issue is really strong this time around. He has gotten really good at developing these characters' internal desires and building the mystery around them by this point. I love, for instance, that when Alex arrives at his new job as the local school teacher, that there's only two kids who go to school in all of Strangehaven, and the other seats in the classroom have straw men that fill them up. There's just an inherent wrongness to it that really works, showing a familiar setting in a very off way. The art, as always, is great. This time, though, I feel as if it shows a bit of a rushness in its quality at certain points, such as this panel that lacks any detail work on the ground leaving the building seem like it's floating in negative space. And a great deal of panels throughout the issue where characters are talking with no backgrounds behind them at all. And this is fine. This is a psychological trick that all comic artists implement. And if done seldomly, our minds don't even notice it when we're reading. But it is done a lot more frequently in this issue than he normally would tend to do, which leads me to believe that it is probably indicative of him having way too much on his plate, which left him, I believe, wishing for an easier way to get all of this done. Issue 12, six months this time. Gary admits that to make ends meet, he has had to start working a day job again, which has further delayed production on Strangehaven. It's ironic that relatively menial tasks can earn you more money, on a regular basis at least, as something which requires such hard work, dedication, and if I may blow my own trumpet for the sake of making this point. Skill as self-publishing your own comic book, but c'est la vie. Sure, I get offers to work within comics, but mostly of the not paying very much if anything at all variety. What's even more frustrating is wasting precious time looking for part-time work, submitting myself for interviews and whiling away unproductive hours in a dead-end job when I have so many better things to do just like everyone else. Time versus money. Very few of us have the luxury of both. As earning a living eats into my production time, daily chores and some pretense of a social life must continue to be maintained, even at a minimal level. Eating, bathing, and the laundry are favorites, but dusting, gardening, and car maintenance are relatively rare pursuits. Additionally, the past few years publishing Strangehaven has coincided with probably the most eventful and disruptive times of my personal life. Births, deaths, marriage, divorce, illness, moving house. It's all been happening here, and particularly so these past six months. For this issue, he continues, like every time, to experiment with techniques within his art. This time, putting a thick, bold line around the characters with a softer, hazier background. Personally, I don't like this quite as much as the detailed line work that peaked in issue 9 for me. But it is still quite well done, and that would be a personal choice kind of thing, as I can imagine a lot really liking this look. And it is a functional style decision that probably saved him a lot of time on the backgrounds that he had to do. For me, it just leaves the work feeling more like edited pop art photographs than drawings at times. But also, I really appreciate that he will continue every issue to experiment with what Strangehaven is. He doesn't become complicit or comfortable with one look. 
He is constantly experimenting, trying to find new techniques so that every issue, you don't really know what it's going to look like in a good way. He also mentions that an intruder broke into his studio one night and cut himself severely crawling through the broken window, leaving a large amount of blood on the floor. He was found later in the parking lot, almost passed out, dying, and was taken to the hospital and recovered. Ironically, he claims that earlier that day he had been working on page 25 of this issue, which features a similar bloody scene. While trying to escape the studio after cutting himself, the man knocked over a large water cooler, ruining a telephone, fax machine, and computer that were on the desk next to it. Not that excuses are any substitute for another issue of Strangehaven. I am often criticized for being late, slow, and infrequent, and I can only agree. However disappointed a reader or retailer may be, I am many times more disappointed than they are, believe me. I must also say that there are readers that support me by suggesting quality is worth the wait. But in all honesty, I would rather see Strangehaven on the racks every six weeks than every six months, if there was any way in which I could enable that. One retailer even suggested that if I couldn't keep to a regular schedule, then maybe I should consider getting out of comics. But while there's some kind of market out there for what I do, I will continue to publish however long it takes. He concludes by saying that the next issue will be delivered before April of 2000. On September 8th, 2000, Millage would publicly speak for the first time in 11 months, putting out a statement addressing the lack of a new issue of Strangehaven. I hope it's apparent from my work that my research, drawing, and rendering are relatively labor-intensive. From day one, I always felt I owed my readers their money's worth. But once I get going, I'm not that slow, really. It's more of a problem being able to find the time to draw. As successful as Strangehaven has been, relatively speaking, as a self-published one-man labor of love, it certainly has not been lucrative enough to support even the most frugal of lifestyles. So, over the past five years, I've juggled a combination of income sources, from part-time employment to letting rooms in my house in order to make ends meet. The holy grail being the job that pays the maximum financially, and yet occupies the least of my time and creative energy. From March 1999, I have been working in a number of roles at the local College of Arts and Technology, and even had a spell as an IT art and design lecturer. But due to the college's high turnover of staff, I've been persuaded to work overtime on a frequent basis to cover for colleagues' holidays, illnesses, and vacant posts. I soon came to the conclusion that a career in lecturing would be incompatible with my comics career, no matter how lucrative, and resigned from that particular post. Unfortunately, I've been working 11 hours a day for many, many weeks, which has not left much time for anything else at all. He also says that he broke his thumb on his drawing hand one day while playing soccer, and that his doctor estimates that it might be 18 months before it fully heals, and that in that time there may need to be surgery. He says that despite this, Strangehaven will continue no matter what, citing other independent comics and creators that have failed in the past. Strangehaven will not be going the same way as big numbers. Gary Spencer Millage will not be going the same way as Martin Wagner. I'll never be David Sim either, but I remain committed to the comics art form and hope to continue to produce my work on a regular basis until either my eyes, limbs, or vital organs fail me. I believe that fate has brought us here and we should be together, babe. Issue 13 arrives almost two years later after the previous one, looking quite different than expected. A new logo, a new cover style. There is no longer a nine-panel grid for the page layout, and wildly different interior art done in an ink wash style which took even longer to produce. Although he argues that the extra time is negligible to the point that it really shouldn't even be considered a problem in the grand scheme of things. I love the new look of it, it feels fresh and reads well you can really get a sense of how much the style has changed. Because in flashback, he recreates a few panels from the early issues, and it really just shows how much he's grown as an artist. Even though it wasn't planned out this way, the ironic thing about Strangehaven taking a two-year hiatus is that the previous issue ends with a very similar cliffhanger 
as the infamous one from Twin Peaks Season 2. And I imagine that there were a lot of readers who by this point assumed that they would never see the series again, and would have been quite happy to see its return. But if it had never returned, in a way it would have almost felt fitting as well. Instead of a traditional open letter that would be expected with a new chapter of the story, Millage instead opts to do something a bit creative and odd, and publishes an interview of himself conducted by himself, including a photograph of two Gary Spencer Millages sitting on the couch together side by side. What follows is a compilation of some quotes from this self-interview. It's been an incredibly frustrating time for me personally and professionally. The problem is that you need a steady wage to pay the bills and put food on the table. Strangehaven is relatively successful for an independently produced comic book, but it's not published often enough to bring in a reliable, regular wage. Education appears to be all about student management, attendance and pass rates these days, rather than trying to teach anybody anything. Teaching would be great if not for the students. In addition, I find it very difficult being creative in both the classroom and in my studio. I still work at the college, but in one of the business support teams rather than in the front lines. He indicates that while his thumb healed, he tried to write as far ahead in the story as he could, as well as gathering his models to take as many photographs of them to speed up the production of future issues. He also indicates that he is in early discussions for a Strangehaven pilot to be shot in Hollywood, but that that will not make his financial situation any easier, unless the show actually gets ordered for a full season and that he was not getting paid for the pilot. This series would not end up happening. He makes a joke that at this rate, Strangehaven still won't be done by 2020. I was gonna clean my room until I got high. I was gonna get up and find the room, but then I got high. My a year passes, and with that, issue 14 arrives. There is no letter this time, no statement explaining where he has been or what he has been up to. It feels silent in a way, without his added commentary. It is just the comic presented by itself. We are by this point deep in the story, and every issue is firing on all cylinders. It has changed a great deal since it began, and what started as a fun passion project has truly become a great work of art within the comics medium. This month, Alan Moore describes Strangehaven as follows. A darkly glittering example of the soap opera noir, Gary Spencer Millage's Strange Haven is an occasionally opening portal into a beautifully realized other world, a plane all the more intriguing and sinister for its resemblance to our own mundane territories. Perfectly controlled and naturalistic storytelling creates a wraparound illusion of the everyday in which surreal and threatening incidents are studded like unnerving little jewels. Gary Millage is a consummate craftsman, a watchmaker, patiently constructing his own unique universe. For a passport to the planet of unsettling delights that writhe beneath the surface of the ordinary, I strongly recommend that you attempt to be there when the portal opens next. Issue 15. Another year, another issue of Strangehaven. All I can say in my defense is that I have been far more productive during the past few months than I have been since the early days of my illustrious career in cartooning. He says that this issue is longer by two pages which are included at no extra cost, which made production take up a little more time. He also decided to put Strangehaven on hold to write and illustrate a short comic for a high-profile charity event as well as drew several covers as a guest artist on different comics. He had the interior of his house remodeled, which also conflicted with his workflow, and with this he mentions that he has left the college and is back at art full-time. How long this situation continues is anybody's guess, but as ever, I remain committed to producing new issues of Strangehaven on as regular a basis as possible. He seems very optimistic about now actually being able to produce Strangehaven in a timely fashion, but reading this, even to ignore where things would end up, his sentiments are hard to believe. The art in this issue has become more simplified. A great deal of panels do not have backgrounds, and those that do are sparse in nature, which in a way goes against the mindset of Strangehaven itself. It is a book named after a town. It is about a tangible place, 
a location that had a presence as a character in previous iterations of the book that now no longer seems to be part of the visual focus. We are hurtling towards in-game territory. All subplots and meandering atmosphere have been left behind to mainline to the finish. And what is lost there is gained in an exciting narrative that feels like it never stops moving. Seeing that shift happen is kind of fascinating and it more or less works. Issue 16. Deadlines are a contrary and extraordinary thing. Without deadlines, nothing would ever get done. If time were infinite, there would be no incentive to finish anything. I've gained a certain notoriety for being slow, which I freely admit is a fair assumption on the basis of the glacial progress on this Strangehaven project. Fairly apparent, I hope, is the actual amount of work involved in writing, researching, and illustrating an ongoing comic book series especially one so rich in detail as this one. Perhaps less obvious is the number of associated tasks involved in publishing, which are usually spread across a number of staff on any regular publisher. On a micro level, I've actually been pretty good about hitting deadlines. I've managed to draw, reproduce, sign, and mail out a Strange Haven Christmas card to certain lucky recipients for the past 10 years without fail by the deadline that just can't be pushed back. I can always be counted on to contribute the required piece for the annual Bristol Comics Festival charity art auction in time. I love that even though it's clear that Millage is attempting to skip to the end as quick as possible so that Strangehaven at least has an ending, leaving a lot of the slower pace behind us, that he's still willing to get weird in the way that the story is delivered. Like this issue which dedicates four pages of the beginning to an aerial World War II battle that had a lasting impact on the town of Strangehaven and also sets up the most beautiful moment in the entire comic. I love that even with the quick pace, we still get little vignettes of character like this. Now, this is going to be the only time in this video that I spoil anything about Strangehaven as far as the plot goes. So skip to the time currently on the screen if you do not want to hear this. There is a retcon that I really do not care for in this issue, that I think is only in service of getting us closer to the end. Earlier in the series, when Susie discovers a body hanging from a tree in the woods, she hears something behind her, and turns around and is swallowed by a bright light, and then disappears. It has obvious supernatural connotations, and I assume is a reference to when the exact same thing happens to Major Briggs and Twin Peaks. This causes the local officer and doctor to begin hunting to try and find what happened to her. But in this issue in flashback, we learn that Billy found her there in the woods, told her that she would be blamed for the murder as the prime suspect, and convinced her to go back to Hong Kong to avoid a life in prison. I hate this. It's the antithesis of mystery and what stories like Strange Haven stand for. It even goes against the very central internal logic of the story, as Strange Haven possesses a mystical magnetic force that doesn't allow people to leave its borders. It makes me feel like Annie Wilkes screaming that he didn't jump out of the cockadoody car. And I think it's the only time that there's a legitimate instance of bad writing and narrative cheating in the series. But I also get it. As you read it, you get the feeling that he was in a George Martin situation, and was terrified that this story had gotten so big that it would never end. And so he's trying to wrap up some of the looser threads on the edge of the world quickly and get rid of some extraneous characters. So while I don't think it is handled particularly well, I also do understand. As usual in his letter, he talks about a great deal of things that have kept him from working. Those little things that life throws at you, that build up and accumulate, and stack and grow, and suddenly another year passes you by. He leaves us with the line, They say that work expands to fill the space available for it. And it is incredible how projects of just about any length tend to go to the very last day or hour even, before they're completed, no matter how much time you allow yourself. This love has taken its storm on me She said goodbye too many times before and Issue 17 Well, it's another year and as per usual It's another editorial feature comprising little more than a list of lame excuses and apologies for the extended period between the last issue of Strangehaven and this one that you hold in your hands 
I think that this must surely be positively the last time that fate can be so unkind as to throw up so many hurdles between me and the drawing board, as to delay the current issue as long as the previous ones. I've seriously considered deliberately avoiding mention of the length of time between issues in a sly effort to mislead any future comic historians, or anyone who hasn't been paying close attention, that Strangehaven was produced in a regular and timely manner. He mentions that since we last saw him, he moved offices, and what he thought would be a process that would take two weeks evolved into a three-month endeavor, which required him to get a new PC and completely change out the faulty wiring in his new office. He got a new puppy, which taking care of and training had eaten away a large amount of time, and he also injured the pinky on his drawing hand while trying to hold back a man who was attempting to escape after committing an armed robbery of a jewelry store, which required a few months to fully recover. He also contracted a stomach infection, which was still affecting him at the time of publishing this issue. The issue ends with an advertisement, which is actually somewhat accurate, saying that Strangehaven 18 would be delivered this summer. Issue 18. How time flies when you're enjoying yourself. Just over 10 years ago, the first issue of Strangehaven hit the comic shops. And somehow, I'm still here still writing and illustrating each episode. Damn, it's still even the exact same price, whatever happened to inflation. And 10 years, you know, is a long time. When I embarked on this mammoth project in 1995, Princess Diana was still married to HRH Prince of Wales, just about, and a couple of years away from her fateful car journey. JK Rowling was still touting her manuscript, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, around the publishers. JK is now famously richer than the Queen. Dolly the Sheep was yet to be cloned, and Toy Story became the first fully computer-generated movie to hit the cinema screens. James Cameron's Titanic was still a couple years off. I guess if you had told me 10 years ago that I would still be working on Strangehaven, I would have been pleasantly surprised. If I had known that I would be on first-name terms with many of my childhood heroes, and been round Alan Moore's house for tea, I would have been amazed. On the other hand, if I'd foreseen that I had only managed to publish 18 issues, and that I'd still be struggling to make a living from my career after 10 years, I would have been bitterly disappointed. But would I have still done it? Hell yes. Here he includes two photographs, one from the very first issue of Strangehaven labeled, Gary in 1995 embarking on his new adventure. The second is of an old man asleep in a chair with the caption, Gary in 2005, after 10 years of self-publishing. He ends, like usual, with an optimistic wish. So what does the future hold? More Strangehaven, that's for sure. How frequently depends on the fine balance between available time and financial return. Here's to the next 10. Cheers. This is the last issue of Strangehaven ever to be produced. The next month, Gary announces in a post titled Strangehaven Invades Europe, that the comic will be translated into Portuguese and French. As he continues to try and branch out into the global market, a Spanish translation is slated for publication in December of 05. He also schedules a convention appearance in Italy to promote the book, where it has recently begun publishing and was up through issue 5. In February 2006, in another turn of bad luck, Another one of Gary's computers is damaged when a pot of hot tea is knocked over top of it. Although he says it initially made fizzing and popping sounds that it occasionally still works well enough to use the internet on. In April, Entertainment Weekly, which in this time would have been a highly read website, runs a highlight on Strangehaven, giving it a positive review, possibly opening it up to a larger audience, and includes the quote, Strangehaven is something of an anomaly. It ambles, it stalls, it digresses. Yet, remarkably, it works. Be this a function of his deft pen, or a disdain for deadlines, Millage flirts just enough with our sense of curiosity to keep us glued to each mesmerizing page, rarely compromising his work's air of impending doom. Oh, baby, when you talk like that. Gary spends July touring Europe trying to promote the different translations of Strangehaven. He talks about the surreal experience of being a featured guest at conventions and public events, with people from media that he recognizes, talking about the odd feeling of rubbing shoulders with the likes of Carrie Fisher, that bloke out of the Tomorrow People, and the big guy from Lost. You're beautiful. 
Gary is pleased that several French publications have given Strangehaven a positive review, and he books a spot as a guest at a French cartoonist's convention. He also says that Strangehaven has begun to take hold in Sweden. It has now been a year since he has given an update on the progress of any future issues. In January of 2007, he mentions new Strangehaven content for the first time since September of 2005, saying that he has contended with a couple pet-related incidents, which haven't exactly facilitated my preparations for the new year, as regards the issue of Strangehaven and the like. He says that his puppy ate an entire pecan with the shell on, and required surgery to remove it, which the recovery from, he insists, became a full-time job. Gary goes silent for almost eight months. It has now been two full years since the last issue of Strangehaven. He puts out the following statement. Gary Spencer Millage is alive and well. The lack of posts over recent weeks are due to a number of reasons, primarily being incredibly busy with non-comic related and comic related work. The freelancer's lot is usually a lot of time spent chasing new jobs without reward. Then a sudden influx of work with concurrent deadlines, which is where I am at present. The implications on the Strangehaven publishing schedule is rather complicated. As a combination of looking for paying jobs and obtaining a few of them, either adequate time or financing has become a problem to enable me to set a schedule for the next issue. The sporadic and infrequent publishing rate of Strangehaven has always been a concern and I am anxious to get enough material amassed prior to any further premature announcements. In a nutshell, Strangehaven is emphatically not dead. Strangehaven is still ongoing, and the publication date of the next issue will be announced when I am sure it can be met. In the meantime, my apologies to my loyal and patient readership. You will see the conclusion of the series one day. Future convention appearances have been shelved for the time being, to allow me more time to concentrate on producing new work. And also, rather pathetically, to avoid the inevitable when's the next issue out type questions. To make ends meet, Gary takes a job to create a how-to book titled Draw Fantasy Figures, and would follow this up in October the next year with a second how-to book on dragons. In his press announcement for this, he sounds a bit depressed about the whole thing while trying to seem excited for it. Of course, it's an interesting project, but not quite the soap opera noir fiction which I've become mildly renowned across small pockets of the Western world. But it pays more, and it's a short deadline, so it should be completed relatively quickly. Wishing all my friends, family, readers, and business associates a wonderfully happy, healthy, and prosperous 2008. My New Year's resolution? More strange haven, I guess. Fingers crossed. In early May on his blog, Millage announces that he will be appearing at two different conventions later that month, ending with the line, Unfortunately, there is still no definite date for the resumption of the Strangehaven series, but it is still a live, ongoing project, and news will eventually be published on this website first. We'll open up your mind and see like me. Gary attends San Diego Comic-Con for the first time in six years. He describes the experience as more low-key than it was in the past for him at the height of Strangehaven's popularity. But despite not having the attention that he once did, he seems like he has a very nice trip. He also mentions that Strangehaven has had to be delayed further, as he has taken classes on how to develop websites to pay the bills, and has several high-profile clients that he has begun to design for. Another year passes. Gary releases another how-to book, this time centered on being a guide to comic book creation and design. He says that taking on this project has delayed New Strangehaven by another six months. In coordination to promote the design book, he sits down for an unusually long interview with Tom Spurgeon of The Comics Reporter. This is a really good interview that covers a whole range of subjects, from things like taste to pure aesthetics of a book 
and you can learn a lot about the way that he thinks in relation to comics from reading it. But on Strangehaven specifically, he had the following to say. Strangehaven has been on an indefinite hiatus since I put out issues 17 and 18, and the collected third paperback conspiracies, during a spurt of activity in 2005. It's not that I burned out as such, but although the self-publishing of Strangehaven was always profitable, it never really brought in enough to live on comfortably. I have always been trying to top up my bank accounts with other jobs, whether they're comic related or not. 2006 and 2007 saw a lot of European editions of Strangehaven being published, and in between freelance work and being invited to all expenses paid exotic foreign comic festivals, I didn't really have any time to start work on the next book. I had hoped to do some freelance comics writing, but after spending a lot of unpaid time working on aborted proposals for companies like Vertigo and Desperado, I found myself at a point where I really needed to start earning some money. The past couple of years have been a bit of a disaster both financially and personally, so freelance gigs like comic book design have become critically important to me. I do want to stress that Strangehaven is still an ongoing project. It's never far from my mind, and it's always on my drawing board, albeit gathering dust. Of course, over the past couple of years, the landscape of the direct market has changed somewhat, and now it's debatable whether I'll be putting Strangehaven out as a periodical when eventually I have completed the next issue, through Diamond. Perhaps it'll have to be continued via a POD or online solution, at least until the fourth and final trade paperback is completed. We'll see. There may be other solutions. But he laments that for the foreseeable future, he will continue to live off of freelance work and web design. Gary goes quiet for over a year, no news, no announcements, and for the first time, he does not send out a Strangehaven Christmas card. Another silent year. This December's Christmas post merely reads, is it that time again already? Festive love to every single one of you. I'll remember 2012 as being a somewhat miserable year, following on from several other miserable years with occasional glimpses of future promises which as of yet remain unfulfilled. Personal and professional circumstances have again limited my time to pursue my dream of resurrecting Strangehaven to virtually nil. Some mysterious minor health ailments have dogged me throughout the year, but most of these have been diagnosed and treated with some success. But the biggest blow was losing my darling bulldog Babs to cancer on September 11th. My Whippet Billy has also been struggling with a treatable but incurable degenerative disease since the year began, but he remains alive enough to eat, poop, and sleep, but mostly sleep. My Christmas card design this year, therefore, is a small tribute to my devoted companions. I also intended to write a short blog post on the status of Strangehaven, which remains a top priority, if a highly elusive one. Keep the faith, brothers and sisters. Wishing you all an enjoyable and peaceful Christmas, and an outrageously happy, healthy, and successful New Year. Millage publishes what is described as the most comprehensive piece ever written on Alan Moore, describing the process as follows. Alan himself was incredibly cooperative, generously making time for numerous interviews in person and by phone, providing family photographs and allowing me access to some of his personal notebooks, which give unprecedented insight into his working techniques from Lost Girls, From Hell, and Voice of the Fire. 
Not a dream, not a hoax, not an imaginary story. Strangehaven will return in May 2014. Those of you who have been patiently and not so patiently awaiting news of the next issue of Strangehaven, since they read issue 18 many moons ago, may want to read that again. I'll wait. Strangehaven will return in May 2014. Yes, after an unanticipated and overlong hiatus, Strangehaven will indeed return in May 2014. New episodes written and drawn by me will appear, starting in the first issue, in a newly revived comics anthology, Meanwhile, published by Soaring Penguin Press. That is to say, as of this point, Strangehaven will no longer be self-published as a standalone comic, but instead will be one of the attractions included in a new anthology comic from the fast-growing British independent publisher. So, why am I not self-publishing? It was certainly always my intent to continue and complete the series as a self-published title. But due to various professional, personal, and financial reasons, the full account will have to wait for another time. It simply hasn't been possible for me to do so. But for the past year or so, I have been actively preparing for its return and trying to find a way of delivering it to my readers. In a nutshell, I needed time to sit down and draw it. And in a freelancer's world, time literally is money. And to do that, I needed some sort of advance on royalties. And in the comics world, this usually means surrendering at least some of the intellectual rights. Which, after spending 12 years or so writing and drawing the series, I was not prepared to give up. And the amount of time, i.e. money, required for me to finish the fourth volume is significant enough that any private funding by way of private investor or Kickstarter would be difficult to secure because of the length of time between funding and delivery. Step forward, John Anderson, Soaring Penguin publisher, with an offer that included things like advance on royalties and no claim to copyright. As John will testify, I still took a lot of convincing, temporarily at least, to abandon my self-publishing philosophy. And the contract details took a while to iron out. Ultimately, I had to choose between this opportunity to get the fourth volume of Strangehaven completed and out in my reader's hands, or to let it remain in limbo while I continued to figure out a way of having my cake and eating it. So although this solution compromises my purest principles of independence, I figured that my readers would rather see new episodes however they were emerged than to wait for some further unspecified period. And so do I. It's been far, far too long, people. Strange Haven is on its way back, friends. Rejoice. Note to current Strange Haven subscribers. I have been making efforts to contact each of you regarding the outstanding issues of your subscription via email, social media, and for those of you who I don't have any other contact for via regular mail. It's likely some of these contacts are out of date, so please, if you believe you have a current subscription, please contact me via my usual email address. May comes and goes with no new Strangehaven. The first issue of Meanwhile hits shelves in October of 2014. It is dedicated with a special thanks to Chris Staros for helping us navigate through the initial choppy waters. The publisher of the magazine, John Anderson, had the following to say about wanting to provide a space where Strangehaven could come to a satisfying conclusion. It started with a simple question. Gary, mate, what would it take to complete Strangehaven? For those of you who don't know Strangehaven, it was the self-published, self-produced series by Gary Spencer Millage. It tore up the tracks. Strangehaven was rightly hailed as one of the finest comics ever produced. But for whatever reason, Gary stopped at issue 18, the story only three quarters finished. It would take a year off, which understandably, Gary couldn't afford. What if we anthologized it? You'd only have to produce about 12 to 16 pages every two months. Could you do that? Well, and that, my friends, is why 12 years after I last published an anthology title, I've returned to publishing one. There's merit to an anthology title, if it's done properly. A strong mix of both ongoing and self-contained stories, so that each issue leaves the reader both satisfied and waiting for the next issue so that creative teams can test the waters before working on a larger narrative in the same vein. Please join us every two months to see what we've lined up. I promise you, you won't be disappointed, unless you miss an issue. 
From here on, what we gain in New Strangehaven, we lose in Millage's thought process and commentary on how the project is progressing as well as his personal life. Since this was now no longer being self-published and was only being released 10 pages at a time in a larger magazine, he no longer gives an open letter with each issue, giving an update on his life events. For the past decade, hearing from him in great depth has been rare, but one thing is for sure, he managed to make Strangehaven continue. Despite every single setback where most people would have given up years before this, he found a way to end it. This magazine that was created explicitly to facilitate an end game for Strangehaven would become the mouthpiece for the series. And Gary would focus more or less on making the art. From here on, Strangehaven would release in 10 page short chapters until enough material was completed to finish the story and release a final fourth trade paperback. And guess what? Strangehaven is in color now, making yet another radical departure in style mid-series which I love to see. The pages are genuinely, truly gorgeous, and a little surreal when you first look at them for just how different they feel. Seeing this, I can really only compare it to the feeling of seeing how the characters are rendered in a new video game that is the sequel to one from the PS2 era. Familiar characters that you've known forever now have a new look through modern technologies. This is also where the character of Adam goes bald, by the way. I didn't want to show that earlier and ruin the color surprise. His beard, which also was black before, now has gone gray. And that can be said for all of the characters who look much older in their appearance in this new iteration of the series, now being called Strangehaven Destiny. I actually have a suspicion that the model for Sergeant Kent was not available or willing to be in these first few chapters for some reason because each of his panels are a lot less rendered than the other characters, except for a few where he seems to have not aged at all, and I suspect for those, old photographs were used. I think this is especially backed up because one could argue that he was the main character of Volume 3, but in this he hardly ever appears at all in scenes where he really should. But this is a great return to form. Since issue 18 in September of 2005, he hasn't lost his touch, and we are immediately thrown back into the action and this world seamlessly. Reading this, you just know that this is what Millage was made to do, and it's such a shame that he had to take a break for so long from his passion projects. Three months later, another issue of Meanwhile, and with that, the second short chapter of Strangehaven. I've never seen art that quite looks like this in a comic. I find myself staring at the panels for a really long time, just taking in their complex expression of emotion. I love that he has found an uncanny halfway point between the drawn and photographic looks, and the color goes a long way in helping this evolution of style. I also love at one point, it is shown that Adam carries a pager on his belt, as technology isn't a very big part of the story at all but there are little reminders like this that sneak in throughout the series that signal that it definitely still takes place in the 90s. And in universe, only two months or so has passed for our characters. At only 10 pages an entry, one does feel that it has only begun once it's finished. But I would much rather take something like this than nothing at all. It is hard to express how much this makes me happy to see, that he was able to find a way to do this and to get this done. He got his own version of Twin Peaks The Return a few years before The Return would end up happening. Issue 3 of Meanwhile. We finally see Jeremy and Janie's 19th birthday party, which was first mentioned as coming up soon in issue 11 that was released in April of 1999. We have a new person that we will get to know get stranded in Strangehaven as well, and they have a modern cell phone with them which I think is another fun inclusion playing with the obviously weird time shenanigans that are supposed to surround the village of Strangehaven. My favorite little detail in this is at the party, there's a quick panel of people holding conversations in the background. And we get this little snippet where one of them says, so 20 years ago today, and the person they're talking to responds, I know, it hardly seems possible. And this is a reference that you will learn has in comic meaning. But it is also a reference that this chapter came out almost exactly 20 years after the very first issue of Strangehaven. And all in all, it's another great short chapter as Millage continues to lay the pieces for the game that will play out in the concluding chapters. Take me to church, I'll worship like a dog at the shrine of the lights, I'll tell you- Issue 4 is three months late, 
In his opening letters, Anderson begins to have a similar tone as Millage did back in the late 90s, right before things turn south. It's a good thing that publishing, meanwhile, is a labor of love. If we were doing it solely for the benefit of having a regular ongoing series, I'd be having second thoughts by now. And that would be a shame because we've seen some terrific stories that we are presenting in upcoming issues. It's terrific stories like this that keep me publishing meanwhile. And ever the optimist. I hope to see you again in two months. Na, 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 na. Gary makes his first public statements in over a year, saying that more Strange Haven in Meanwhile is still coming but taking longer than expected, and that he has no real concrete information on the series, saying, This lack of news of which I speak is probably mostly due to the amount of time I've actually spent working this year, as opposed to writing blog posts and curating my collection of Paisley shirts. Not only drawing and coloring the new episodes of Strangehaven, but being rather unfortunately sidetracked into designing elaborate footwear catalogs, and building outrageously ambitious websites for freelance clients in an attempt to pay off various bills that have somehow accrued ostensibly by the mere act of existing. One heartwarming thought, though, is that I've produced more pages of Strangehaven in the past 12 months than I have done in all of the years since 2005, laid end to end. So I'm counting that as a win, but I can do more. He says that 2016 will bring a lot of new Strangehaven content. Issue 5 and another 10 pages. Anderson says, Well, that took longer than I had expected, but we're back. Have I mentioned that we'll be keeping a quarterly schedule? And do you believe me? Skepticism is healthy. Wait and see. Gary's art has reached a higher level of detail and design. Every single panel feels painful to look at for its meticulousness. And there are a few new twists thrown in there that recontextualize everything in the story which shows just how many certain beats of this have been worked out in advance for over 20 years. Issue 6 arrives on time. The art has begun to look photorealistic to an unsettling degree that really works for the tone that Strangehaven has always tried to set. I think this chapter is really elevated to the best that the comic has ever looked. Just the way that shadows fall in each panel really brings it to a whole new level. It feels like a sinister take on the soap opera genre, in ways that few things have ever managed. By this point, Strangehaven has reached a visual level where comics just don't aspire to. The medium was never meant for something like this. There isn't anything that looks like this. But it works here in such a great way. By this stage, literally every single panel is a masterpiece. Issue 7 of Meanwhile, and as we are getting closer to the end and there aren't many parts that can be shown off without ruining events of the story, from here on to avoid spoilers, I will not be showing many panels from the most recent chapters of Strangehaven Destiny. Issue 8 releases. John Anderson steps down from overseeing Strangehaven and Meanwhile to focus on other projects for his publishing company, and he hires Tim Pilcher to run the book. Issue 9. Strangehaven is not included this time in the anthology. Millage says the following in announcing that he would be skipping an issue. Strangehaven Destiny Episode 9 won't be in the issue due to some minor but disruptive health troubles leading to some lifestyle changes. A heavier workload for my freelance design, much of it due to the GDPR. Involvement with the Where We Live project and other factors. I've taken an enforced break from drawing for much of this year. He does say though that he is back to work on the ninth chapter of this version of Strangehaven, and that it will appear in Meanwhile issue 10 that will come out early next year.
On the face of it, 2019 has not been a productive year for me. There's been no new issue of Meanwhile, and ergo, no new Strangehaven. But work has been continuing behind these dusty curtains, and word is that there will be a Meanwhile relaunch next year. Rest assured, dear reader, my main concern, as ever, is the completion of the Strangehaven project I initially conceived in 1993. And just like the Marathon Runner, these last yards are the hardest. But with you cheering me on, I'm sure the finish line will soon be in sight. It has been 25 years since the first issue of Strangehaven was published. If you told me in 1995 that I would still be creating new Strangehaven stories 25 years later, I would have been overjoyed. If you had told me that I would be working on Volume 4, then maybe not so much. After the initial euphoria of contributing in a modest way to the art form which I have always loved, the financial and physical realities of making a full-time living from creating comics gradually became apparent. But I am nothing if not resilient. And I have pressed on through good times and bad, through personal upheavals, bereavement, and health troubles, to prestigious award nominations, potential movie deals, meeting my comics heroes, and making new, lifelong friends. The last quarter century has been a weird, wonderful, and wild ride, and I don't regret a moment of it. But please, no congratulations on reaching this milestone just yet. I don't deserve an accolade merely for persistence. You can save those until I actually finish this bloody thing. Then we can talk about the ticker tape parade. There's some whores in this house. 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 I can't pretend that it hasn't been a frustrating time creatively, with absolutely nothing new being released this year. My health issues and other factors mean that a couple of other projects that I had intended to pursue this year have effectively been put on hold for now. But I sincerely hope to make one or two announcements regarding Strangehaven in the coming months. He says that the publisher has, because of financial reasons, decided to move to a crowdfunding model for Meanwhile, where each individual issue of the magazine would have its own Kickstarter to publish. And that, mixed with COVID, has created a gap of almost two years with no new Strangehaven. He seems very upset by this, and also depressed that the 25-year anniversary happened a few months into the pandemic, and that he had to celebrate alone in his home instead of hosting a party. He asks for people to please not give up hope on him, and he reassures that he is going to end Strangehaven on his own terms. For this one, we need a little bit of a flashback. So, in 2015, Chris Staros' company, Top Shelf Productions, was purchased by IDW to be used as an imprint for them. He was placed as editor-in-chief of that imprint. In September of 2021, IDW purchased the film and television rights to develop a live-action version of Strangehaven. Probably as a show, as they have had recent successes doing this with other comics, like Winona Earp and Lock and Key. Millage would say, I'm very excited to have the team at IDW Entertainment working towards bringing Strangehaven to the screen, and I have no concern about their commitment to the project. It took 10 years for Lock and Key to get made into a Netflix series, including two previous pilot episodes that were both filmed and discarded. Now Lock and Key has been renewed for a third season. Can you kiss me more? Meanwhile, issues 10 and 11 have been crowdfunded and released soon after with new Strangehaven chapters. Save your tears for another day. In Praise of Shadows releases a video documenting the long and laborious production of the comic Strangehaven called The Comic That Is Impossible To Finish. And why did he call it that? Because in all of the time leading up to Strangehaven Destiny, I never got the inclination that the series was ever actually supposed to end after four volumes. In fact, Millage has publicly contradicted that multiple times, saying that he would have been happy to learn that he got to write and draw Strangehaven for decades. In all the years and everything that was said, it always felt like the project was intended to be bigger in scope than that. It's a comic about a whole town, after all. And in no time before the creation of Meanwhile, does Millage give a clue that the series was close to an ending. 
meanwhile seems to be a creation to facilitate a graceful exit to an unfinished legacy series. But that's also not a bad thing. Because by its very nature, Strangehaven is an impossible idea to pull off. For one man to by himself create a book documenting the lives of the population of a whole town with this level of detail and emotional intimacy and then publish and ship that entire thing by himself for decades to make sure that it was done correctly is a Herculean task. Art by its very nature should be impossible. It is taking nothing and turning it into something. It is one of the few forms of real, genuine magic that we have. And like all art, even at its conclusion, and we are near that conclusion, Strangehaven will be something that is abandoned rather than finished. The pure ideal of Strangehaven, unaffected by the realities of time and money, still floats out there in the collective ether. But in reality, in our world of time and money, people get old, people are finite, their energy is not unlimited, they have lives, loves, and many other interests that call to them along the way. And part of Strangehaven being an impossible idea to actually pull off is, to me, what makes it so human. Maybe the reason I've been called to this story so much is that I'm Gary Spencer Millage. Not really, that was for dramatic effect. I'm Zane Whitener, you know that. But my story and many others started off very similar to his, and it could have ended in a similar way as well. As I've said in the past, I tried hard to get started in comics, and the pitches that I put together were both really bad and incredibly time-consuming to make. I spent a few years of my life drawing consistently every single day that I wasn't at work, and it got me nowhere. That's not to say it isn't worthwhile at all. Art should be done for one's own personal satisfaction. But a part of that draw, I think, is wanting to share that with other people and have a genuine connection with another person. Art is a means to be seen as a person and through that understood. Where I'm getting at is that I'm mostly just saying that had I been a little better, I might have chased that pot of gold for years. If I felt like I was close enough to success, I might have done it for decades. And in hindsight, I know for a fact that I would have never gotten there. But the tragic thing here is that unlike my pitches, Strangehaven is actually really, really good. It is an excellent comic and one of the best that I have ever read. And hardly anybody knows about it. There have been two posts in all of Reddit history about it. And most of the times that it's ever been mentioned there was 10 years ago. I don't think there has ever been a tweet about Strangehaven to ever get more than 50 likes. Except one. When Millage announced that IDW had purchased the television rights, which got 208 likes. At the time of writing this, he has 614 followers on Instagram. I'm sure that many of you watching this thought at some point of George Martin and the forthcoming Winds of Winter that has been forthcoming now for over a decade. Something that he is reminded of in the replies every single time he says something publicly, no matter the subject, even if it is him tweeting about a friend who died as if he were not a human. Neil Gaiman famously said in 2009 that George R. R. Martin is not your bitch. People are not machines to farm content. People have a limit that they reach and it eventually comes for us all. Creators have a right to take their time with their creations. I think they owe nobody anything except themselves. Good things take good time. They have a right to not want to continue something or to decide that it is time for things to come to an end even if it wasn't projected beforehand. I'm not going to do this, but it is fully within my right to say that this is the last you will ever hear from me. This is the series finale. No more videos after today. At times it feels as if the act of making anything is impossible. The idea of creating something that is bigger than oneself is a hazardous road to go down. If we are being fully open, honest, and transparent, Berserk killed Kentaro Mura. Stress is a hell of a thing. Most healthy people who aren't undertaking a monumental, impossible task don't suddenly die at the age of 54. He spent the last years of his life being hounded online because of the many breaks between issues. The same thing that is currently happening with Tagashi and Hunter x Hunter. It's a phenomenon within all mediums. We probably would never have seen the end of the Dark Tower if King had not been hit by that car. In the years up to that point, people were constantly asking him when we were going to continue our journey to the tower. 
something I imagine everyone who has created something that is well loved universally resents. There are YouTubers like HBomb and ContraPoints who only make one or two videos a year, and that's okay. They always knock them out of the park, but even if they didn't, it would still be okay. I guess what I'm trying to get at here is that empathy for the people who make the things that you love is important. Even if it takes them years to make that work, even if they never finish it in the way that you thought that they would, or if they never finish it at all. We may never get The Winds of Winter, and that's okay. He still wrote some excellent books that gave us a place to feel happy and safe. And he should be allowed to enjoy his old age and write video games or work on anything that he wants to that isn't related to Westeros. Writing a series like that was in its own way impossible as well. It took Alan Moore and Eddie Campbell seven years to make From Hell, which is largely considered to be a classic of the medium. And in all conversations that surround it, it is never brought up how long it took to complete. Black Hole is 12 issues long and took 10 years to create. Bernie Wrightson and Steve Niles' Frankenstein, Alive, Alive, started being published in 2012, and Wrightson would pass away before the fourth and final issue was released in 2018. Saga famously had a break between issues 54 and 55 that stretched from July of 2018 to January of this year. All of those things are great works despite and because of the human necessities that influenced their creation. Gary once said that, Compared to creating a new work of art, I think criticism is pretty easy. Criticism has its place, of course, but good criticism is far rarer than good art. It's so liable to be skewed by personal taste and prejudices. And genuinely, I really hope that he sees what I've put forth here as a good example of both criticism and promotion of his work. It's something I always aim for, to create the most true to emotional form of expression that I can. But in this instance, it would be a lie to say that it hasn't been a bit uncomfortable for me this time around. I know for a fact that he will very quickly learn that this video exists, probably later today. And I would bet money that he watches it. And so Gary, if you're here, I hope you've liked it. That's important for me. But I didn't want to shy away from the real events of the story that influenced how Strangehaven was created. Because how it was created, I feel, informs so much of how different parts of the story hits. Because it is a story about humans and how they interact and the life obstacles they face, made by one who faced similar obstacles for decades, and still made great work despite that. If we could get him to a place where the end of Strangehaven is recognized and celebrated, as the end of a 30-year commitment to artistic vision, if we could get Gary to a place of being financially successful off of his art by the end of this project, I just think it would be an amazing thing to see. It would be an amazing thing for us to be able to do that. I'm going to put a link below this in the description for the video, to his online shop where you can order volumes of Strangehaven directly from him. I really hope that one day we can get to a place where you can walk into any comic shop in the world and pick up a trade paperback of it. Compassion and empathy are what's on my mind throughout this whole series. People needing human connection and understanding from each other. You never know the story that is happening behind the public performance. You never know the realities that affect the human who dedicated more time than can really be comprehended to something that you'll consume in an afternoon. I want people to know Strangehaven. I want people to buy it. I want the effort that went into this to be a celebrated thing. I don't want almost 30 years of millage making art to be forgotten or sink back and disappear into the shadows, into the unlimited list of independent comics from the past hundred years. Because he sat alone day after day, month after month, year after year, decade after decade, creating a classic, and largely has gone unrecognized for this. It's ending soon, and nobody is talking about it, but that can change. Strangehaven only has a few chapters left before the end of Volume 4 which ultimately will be the end of the entire thing, and I can't wait to see how it all unfolds. The portal is opening again soon for one of the last times. There's this beautiful section in the seventh issue of Strangehaven, where it feels like he's writing in an almost meta sense about how he views the comic, and himself, destiny, how things all converge in horrible and wonderful ways. The harshness of just everything that is constantly happening to us all, that can only be accepted as forces that are beyond our control. 
It is the moment where Alex fully comes to terms with the fact that the village is somehow a supernatural force that is holding him and everyone else there against their will within its borders. And Steve, the local man who lives down on the beach, tries to comfort him, telling him that he's not alone in this process, and that it's not just happening to him, but everyone all at once in their own unique ways. He says, At least if we are stuck here, I can't think of anywhere I'd rather be stranded. She is beautiful, but a prison's still a prison, right? But we're all prisoners of something to a certain degree, aren't we? Prisoners of this planet. Prisoners of our own limitations as human beings. Prisoners within our own relationships, even. Listen, I've been stuck here nine years this autumn. May never get out of this place. I'm not sure if I even want to anymore. I've had a good life since I've been here, and I've gotten a hell of a lot better at surfing, too. This is where you're meant to be right now. Don't waste time trying to fight it. Just go with the flow and try and catch the right wave when it comes along. Know what I'm saying? If 